Welcome to Le Rendez-vous. My name is Garance Doré and I'm a writer with so many stories to tell and ideas to share that I created this special moment to talk about all the things that are going on in our lives. So come, let's spend a moment together. Le Rendez-vous is brought to you by Doré, the skincare line I co-created, wanting to bring more simplicity and efficacy to our lives. Check out the end of the episode for a special code just for you, the Rendezvous listeners. I love how we have names for everything now. For so many years, I didn't even know what I was because there was not a name for it. Until one day I discovered that I was a serial monogamist. It's true that I did have a boyfriend one day telling me that I just kept going from one branch to the next, never really landing on solid ground, and I had totally brushed it off and responded, well, what can I do if I just keep meeting great people? Is this my fault? And that really sums it up. Very rarely you question yourself. This is why today I thought it would be good to explore the problem with serial monogamy. Just to give you a little bit of a landscape of my love life. You have to know that I fell in love for the first time when I was 13 and that this love story lasted for seven years. I thought he was the man of my life. We had plans for forever and I was so naive, but this is what I was living. And I went through all my teenage years having this boy supporting me and being by my side. And I really never got to experience all the frustrations and the tests and trials that teenagers usually experience in their love lives. I was myself surprised I had met him and boom, that was us until I was 21. I have to admit that at that time there was a little bit of overlap. I did meet someone when I was 17, broke up with my first boyfriend, stayed with the new boyfriend for a year, then broke up with the new boyfriend, went back to my old boyfriend, and that was until I was 21. <laughs> then I met somebody else, started something that I think lasted two years. It's just, you've heard about serial monogamy. We're just all the same. There is not one second that is spent single. If I go back through all my stories, it's basically cycles. Five years, seven years, five years, two years, five years. If you try to put them all together, you would think I had seven lifetimes. Even to me, sometimes it doesn't make sense. And there wasn't that many overlaps. When I was younger, maybe. But as I got older, I got a little bit more respectful and try to end things well, even if I always had something in the background already starting to happen. So it all went along like that until four years ago, when I finally was single. But until then, I had never been single. Of course, I was alone at some moments in my apartment or when I was traveling or when, as it happened, some of my boyfriends were not living in the same town as I did. Overall, there was always someone to answer the phone. There was always someone to have drama with. There was always someone to have vacation with. There was never true loneliness. And I'm not talking about the solitude of having a whole day on my own or a whole week, as I talked about in my episode about solitude. I'm talking about this idea of always having someone in the background that you're intimately attached to. The thing with never really being single is that I never really saw the problem. I thought, well, it's just that I meet great people and that I fall in love and then we live something beautiful and then it's over and then something new starts. I remember also when I was young and a bit ignorant, I thought maybe that's going to be my lifestyle. I didn't have a lot of examples of lifelong loves. And so I thought maybe this model is actually a better one when you just let love have its best moments. And when it becomes boring, you just move on. 
I had all sorts of justifications for my behavior. And the thing with always being with someone and always having someone ready when you're about to leave is that obviously you can never really be challenged or feel rejected. There is very little challenge because before you're able to think about what went wrong in your relationship, you're already on to the next. You're already back into the excitement and the infatuation phase with a new person. There is no introspection because you don't have time to just sit down and cry and look back. My breakups were always the easiest thing because I always was thinking of somebody new. And because of that, I had become quite entitled. It was so easy to just criticize the love story and the man I was about to leave or I just left. And then just dive into another one without ever asking myself what I had done wrong. And I would bring into a new relationship all the things, all of these beliefs that I had. A lot of them I had inherited from my mother and her very destructive way to love. And if you want to hear a little bit about how I used to be in those relationships, you can listen to the episode I did about the man project. It will give you kind of an idea. I never was worried about leaving. It was an easy thing to me. I would give it all the chances. I was not an absolute horror of a girlfriend. I still wanted to try to make it work. And I was deeply attached to the guys that I was with. I just think I didn't know what was true love, what was true commitment. I was committed to love itself more than I was committed to the people that I was loving. And when I think about it now, it's almost like I was just going around the world, projecting my idea on love on anybody that would want to be part of it. And that's one of the big issues is I think I was never in love with people. I was in love with love. So I had this image for myself and for others of this very strong, very independent person that can leave relationships when things aren't well. That was one of the things that would freak out my boyfriends. They knew because not only did I tell them, but I think they could also sense this restlessness inside of me. And probably they felt that there was a lack of depth in the way I was loving them. And they could feel that I was here today, but I could be gone tomorrow. And I had a few boyfriends that told me that this was terrifying to them. They always felt it and they always knew that one day I would just leave. Through all my years of serial monogamy, I had only been broken up with once. All the other times, I left. Just keeping in with that sense of never challenging myself, never questioning who I was, what I was doing, and how I was doing it. The one time that one of my boyfriends, one of the ones that I had loved the most in my life, broke up with me because I had become completely crazy, possessive and jealous and I didn't know any limits because I had been brought up in a place where drama is love and love is drama and I would reproduce that until somebody would tell me to stop and he did. And to this day, it's the only true breakup that I ever went through where I didn't decide to leave. And I'll never forget it because it was one of the most painful times of my life and probably terrified me and I never wanted to experience that again. I had created a system that on the surface worked for me. I never faced myself. I kept my partners terrified, which gave me power. And I left them before they left me. So I would never face my fear of being abandoned. I think that ingrained in the depths of me is something that I recognize in people in my family. My father is the same, my mother is the same, my sister, my brother. No one is single and almost no one has ever been single. I think we all carry a real terror of being alone. And I always thought that I didn't have it because of my capacity to leave so quick and to be so strong and to rebuild a life and to find a new apartment. But all of these were more gesticulations. It was just a different way of 
reaching the same outcome. The truth is, two days later, one month later, at the most, I would be meeting somebody new and start all over again. This terror of abandonment is something that I've never really been able to solve or to understand or to look at. What I know is that anytime I was single, I would become crazy and this completely insecure person looking around for someone. And that, when I look back, is probably the most terrifying part. It was much easier to create a whole new love story from scratch with all the ingredients I already had in my head than to face my demons, my fears, all the things that my love confidence was hiding. And one of the many problems with doing that is that it's not really a person that you're looking for. It's just a screen onto which you can project your idea of love. And because of that, you're just not very selective. And it's not that you're lucky or that you're irresistible or that love always finds you wherever you go. It's just that you pick the first person that will let you have them. And then you project everything onto them until one day it all falls apart because it always does. These types of stories based on anything but reality, they never succeed. And I think that's at the core of what serial monogamists do. The core of it is the fear of abandonment, the terror of being lonely, and the manifestation of it are these incredible love stories that pop like mushrooms everywhere in their lives. So for many years, I had this sort of cockiness, this hubris and this fake confidence about love, about knowing what it was, about knowing what I wanted, about being strong, unbreakable, somebody that can move on if she's not respected, and somebody that truly had never been challenged, and whose feelings and emotion had never been broken, which I think is one of the most important ways to attain maturity. And because of that, I was in some way a sort of a a long-term man-eater, a kind of a little bit emasculating, instillating a certain sense of fear in the people that I was with. Have you ever been in a relationship and not feeling seen? Feeling like the person is with you, but they don't really understand you? Feeling that it could be you, but it could be another person? I might have been like that because of all the projection that I was doing on my boyfriends, but I kept going. I kept going and slowly, painfully, started to see myself for who I really was. Fearful, not so confident. These moments when I was single that were usually very short always showed me how insecure and fragile I was. I would get into a new relationship with a frenzy. There was a fever, a place inside of me where I would forget everything else. I would move continents. I would change everything. I don't think I would even be real with the people that I was meeting. I think I was ready to trade anything against being single. I would always say to my friends who were single, oh, you're so lucky. What freedom you have. Look at me with my boyfriend. He's this and he's that. And I envy you. But the truth is, as much as intellectually, the lifestyle of being single really made me dream. I think profoundly in the depth of my psychology, it was absolutely impossible. There was no room for that. So I would do anything. I would go on apps. I would get set up on dates. I would meet guys and idealize them and think this is the love of my life. This is it. I've met him. And then when it wouldn't work, I would just already be on to another project. I didn't want to confront my demons, but at some point I put myself in a relationship that was so wrong. That was such a culmination of everything that I had been creating in my life. 
with never giving myself the time to reflect, to look at my actions, to criticize myself, to challenge my thoughts. And I think that the universe decided to give me the relationship that I deserved. One with someone that was as shallow as I was, that completely matched me on all the fears, on all the cockiness, and we basically destroyed each other. And I ended up in a depression. And I'll have to do an episode about depressions because I think depressions can be one of the most positive things in someone's life. It is the moment when things truly can change. And in my case, truly breaking down all the foundations that were so unhealthy, those foundations on which I had built all my emotional lives. Only a depression could do that. And only from there could I rebuild. So after my second to last relationship, I found myself alone. Finally, looking back, and I started the work and I understood a lot of things that I had done and all the mistakes and all the misconceptions and all the ways in which truly I was hurting myself. I did that, but if I'm being honest, I had a year of being single and that year was all about me healing on one side, but also dating constantly and constantly trying, even if kind of against my will, trying to recreate that process that I knew. But the funny thing is that for the first time, it wasn't working. I was meeting guys, falling in love the same way I had always done. And all I got was rejections. I couldn't tell you why it was. Maybe it's because I wasn't doing it the same way I used to. Maybe it's because I had changed. Maybe it was because I was at a different age. But I kept being punched in the face by these people that I thought, oh, this is him, this is a new one. And as much as I laugh about it now and I, and I look at it and I find it interesting, I can see all my terrors that were acting out in the background. Really, I was single, but my mind was always busy with someone, always. I could feel that, yes, I had changed and yes, life had shown me that I just couldn't keep going the way I was going, but there were parts of me and parts of my programming that just could not change, that just kept wanting to go in the same direction. It's like that metaphor of the elephant, right? Where all your habits, all your trauma, all the things that you've been raised to, to believe, all those things represent the elephant. Elephant wants to go somewhere and you're sitting on top, a little rider, and that's your will and that's your conscious mind. And you're like, no, 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 elephant. I want to go in that new direction. Look. I've discovered so much about myself and the old path we were taking is not good. Let's change directions. But the elephant is so strong and the power of habit and the power of trauma and all this programming was so strong that it just kept going there. And I did therapies and I did psychics and I read thousands of self-help books, but nothing would change. Until one day, I did meet a guy. And if it was something that felt more peaceful than anything else, it's because I think we recognized each other's needs right away. I think we both wanted the same thing. Something strong, powerful, something a really calm, beautiful. We had the same values, something that really matched and that made the process of finding each other and of becoming a couple easier and less stressful and traumatic than all the other relationships I had had before. And that's the man I am with today. And I think it would be easy for me to say, oh, you worked hard on yourself and you finally were healed. And that's when the right guy came onto your path. There are so many ways that we romanticize or say, oh, 
you had paid your dues and the universe sent you the right man. What I truly believe is that the man that I am with today and that I married is someone whose psychological profile fits well with mine. Our traumas imbricate. Both our weirdness work together. We're able to assuage each other's fears. Of course, I have grown and I'm able to see him as the man that he is. I can feel that it's not the old way that I had to project onto someone and that we have this beautiful, always evolving, flourishing relationship, something that I certainly never had before. But romanticizing the outcome of my life and of the story of being the eternal serial monogamist would be a mistake. Because the truth is, you can't heal yourself into finding love. Because you'll never be healed. There is never a world where you're perfectly in tune with yourself and you've explored all your trauma and all your fears are calmed down and you're this great person that stands on two feet and just reflects light. Nobody is like that. We all come to love with fears, with trauma, with weird things, with things we want to hide, with misconceptions that we bring from our families, our upbringing, the things we lived before. And truly, in love, we're never really ready. A person who's a good match will actually help you on your path. He will fill emotional gaps you didn't even think you had. And together you'll grow. And that's why I never want to present myself as an example or my story as a victory against all odds because of where I come from and because of the serial monogamies that I was that finally evolved. I think in love we have to do with what we have and who we are and those things that truly probably will never change. My fear of abandonment will probably always be there somewhere. I'll find different ways, different creative outlets to soothe myself, but profoundly it will always be here. The only thing that I would do today is ask myself, am I seeing the real person here? Am I falling in love with a projection, a project, or am I falling in love with a person? How do I feel around that man? Do I feel calm? Do I feel support and protection? There is never a moment in life when we're fully fixed. We're always going around carrying our wounds, our flaws, our psychological makeup. Some things we'll be able to fix. Some things will never change. And I think it's important to realize that and to realize that falling in love is falling in love with a person that can match that in a way that's positive, in a way that will bring us what we need. In my case, love and peace and desire and pleasure, intellectual connection, all these things that were on my list because I had the list before I met him and it pretty much matched it. Life shouldn't be a perfection project. You'll never meet the perfect guy because he doesn't exist and you'll never be perfect anyway. You'll never be a hundred percent healed. You can work on the few things that are standing in your way. You can do therapies. You can fix your relationship with your mother, with your father, with trauma in your lineage. But the best thing that you can expect is just to feel at ease in your life. It's just to feel comfortable enough, unencumbered, in a state of serenity towards yourself and the world around you. If you're able to reach that, I think it's good enough. And if you're able to reach that with a partner, with not perfection, but a sense of satisfaction, then honestly, I think this is beautiful and it's good enough. I wanted to show that the problem of serial monogamy is that it's built on fear and on projections and on this terrible fake self-confidence that masks the truth of our very human imperfections. 
And that's why it's so important to drop that quest for power, for constant safety, and for blind self-confidence. And to try to look at what our relationship patterns say about us. This constant quest for perfection, for a better relationship, for better men, better boyfriends, is masking so many insecurities and in so many ways in hiding ourselves behind this type of behavior we never give ourselves the chance to experience true imperfect love the main thing that i wanted to tell you is that you have to keep trying until you find your own sense of balance and that you'll never be ready and that you'll keep making mistakes and that there might be a part of you that's never fixed I know, for example, that I'm much better when I'm in a couple because when I'm single, I'm terrified and I'm ready to throw myself into any relationship that comes by. And that I was lucky this time and that I wish for the best for the love that I finally found and that I wish for the best for you in your love life. Whether you choose to be single, whether you realize like me that your better self is in a couple, and that there are some things you'll never understand about yourself the same way there are some things you'll never understand about the others and that it's fine and it's okay to surrender to our own mysteries and to let in the love have a good rest of your day and talk to you next week le rendez-vous is brought to you by doré doré's latest launch la micellaire is a botanical micellar cleansing water that doesn't require rinsing. Minimize bathroom time and maximize outdoor time with our super simple routine. Use code PODCAST10 for 10% of your first order. Thank you for listening to Le Rendez-vous. If you want to know more about me, find out about my newsletter and my community. Find me on Instagram at Garance Doré or at my website at garance.world. And well, if you'd like to find out how to spell that crazy name, just check out the show notes. Until next time, sending you love.